Um, welcome to this uh, session today. I have the uh, distinct honor of introducing two really great speakers that we uh, convinced to save themselves to the end of this conference so that we would have an awesome session here right at the end of the conference. And the first person I want to introduce is, uh, is Robert Valorand. Um, some of you may have uh, heard in my opening speech that Bob Valorand is probably one of the first takers into SDT, and I consider him a founding member of uh, the self-determination theory community. And the reason you can know that empirically is you can listen to all the French-Canadian accents that are at this con, <laughs> and that has something to do with Bob Valorand. Uh, his talk today is going to be the role of passion in psychological resilience. And the second speaker is Susan Fowler, and I've known Susan for some years from uh, and when I, what I can say is she's one of the foremost voices of SDT in the organizational community. She's an outstanding organizational consultant, and we're so glad to have her here as a speaker today. So without further ado, Bob. Uh, can you hear me <coughs> clearly uh, in the back? Yes. If not, please feel free to move forward. You know, we're just about 10 or 11 here in the room, so. Um, founding father, man, we're getting old, Rich, right? <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here, and Rich, I preach, appreciate your friendship over the years. It's been uh, great. The same for uh, Miriam and Ed, and uh, for me, Bushra, it's been uh, it's great to know you and being, you know, as a person as well as a scientist. Um, okay, today I'll be talking about passion and resilience, and first part, a little bit about passion, the second part about the, the, the role it plays in resilience. So a lot of people talk about passion and how it can you know, lead to positive outcomes. Steve Jobs, you know, talk about passionate people who can change the world. Nadia Komenich, <coughs> the, the first gymnast to have a perfect notes at the Olympics. And John Bon Jovi, for those who play music here, says that nothing is as important as passion. No matter what you do with your life, be passionate. So you can see here that these people are advocating for passion, it's important, they lead to positive outcome. But there's a downside. For instance, Eric Cancona, former professional uh, soccer player, who says that if you have a passion and you pursue it to the exclusion of other things, that becomes dangerous. So there might be a downside to passion, and the duality of passion is what I've been, I'll be talking about today, and uh, especially with respect to, to resilience. Right. So what is passion? Well, when we got started back in the late 90s, <clears throat> in fact, a lot of people at the conference were involved in, in, in that research, early research, Rich Kessner, Geneviève Majot, Catherine Rattel, and Marilène Gagné as well. Well, we, we thought that there'd be thousands of papers on passion. Basically, there was nothing in psychology. So what we ended up doing is read the philosophers. So meet Mr. René Descartes right here. And there were two camps in, in philosophy. The first one, stay away from passion, it's bad for you. Stay away from it. So Plato, up to Spinoza, all these people saying that you know, it will come to control you, it's bad. And there's a second camp which, is, which you know, sees basically passion as being more positive, especially the romantics with Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Hegel and Kierkegaard. Even Kierkegaard even said that you know, life without passion is not worth living. Gee, talk about you know, this continuum from stay away from passion to life is not worth living without passion. So these two camps actually underscore what the, the late people that I presented before, Steve Jobs and, Canto and the other uh, people said that you know, passion can be good or bad. And um, this led to our dualistic model of passion to, to focus on uh, the two types of passion. And our take is very closely related to SDT uh, and, you know, we believe that what people try to do in life is to experience self-growth. People want to grow both biologically and the self as well, and they want to expand, but they don't expand in a random fashion. They expand in areas where, actually what Ed D.C. was talking about years ago in, in his 75 book, he, ta he was talking about the joint need of self-determined competence to be good and to expand, to face challenges in the area that you've chosen. I think it's the same thing with passion. Passion eventually develops and leads lead you to expand in the areas you feel you want to expand in. 
and so in, by so doing, you become passionate, you become better, you, you tackle you know, additional challenges, and eventually you expand as a person and you experience self-growth. However, not all passions are the same. There are two types of passion, as you'll see, and some of them lead to full self-growth, both in the area you're passionate about and the rest of your life, whereas the other one is more self-constricted to the area you're passionate about. Okay, so how do we see passion? A well, passion is a strong inclination toward a specific activity. It could be an object, person, belief that we love, value, invest time and energy in, and is part of identity. So passion is not a trait. People are not passionate for everything or anything. No, it's very specific. Um, and it could be an activity like playing basketball, could be an object, having a card collection. Could be a person, romantic passion, for instance. Even parenting, the uh, passion for par parenting, as we've seen in, in this conference. And could be a belief, ideology, like being passionate for the independence of the province of Quebec in Canada, back home. Um, and there are two types of passion that reflects the duality of passion I was talking about before, um, harmonious and obsessive. And again, you know, in, in line with SDT, the way the, that the activity that you love has been internalized in self and identity will lead to, you know, the type of passion that you may have for an activity. So if the internalization process is more autonomous, you, you, the activity is part of you merely because you love the activity so much, then it leads to harmonious passion. Whereas with obsessive passion, you still love the activity dearly, but you internalize the, the activity in a more controlled fashion. Or, I love playing the guitar, and if I continue, I'll be popular at school. So there is this control aspect of it. And when we look at harmonious passion, well, it obviously this desire to engage in the activity, but you can still control the activity. Um, and it will lead you to be choiceful, deciding when to do it, not to do it, be able to say no when it conflicts with other stuff in your life. And it will lead to having access to adaptive self-processes like mindfulness and, and emotional regulation and so on. Um, it will be in harmony with other aspects of your life and your identity. And it will lead to positive emotional experience, flexible persistence, persisting when the, when the time it comes to persist, but then putting it aside when it's more adaptive to do so, and lead to full self-growth, both in the activity you're passionate about and in the rest of your life because it doesn't conflict with the aspect of your life. With obsessive passion, you love the activity just as much, but it comes to control you. And it will get you, obviously, into, into trouble. Um, the internalization process is not as adaptive, it's more controlled, and the ego will be more ego involved when you engage in the activity, and those adaptive self-processes you don't have access as much as with harmonious passion. There will be conflict with other roles that you may have in your life, and it will lead to mixed emotional consequences. You may get some positive emotions, but you will also get the negative emotions. And you, the persistence will be rigid. Again, with rigid persistence, you get into trouble because you persist while you should not. And it will lead to limited self-growth, which means self-growth within the activity you're passionate about, but not in the rest of your life. So basically, passion is dynamic. There are two sides, right? And because the the, um, the internalization process is never 100% autonomous or 100% controlled, both types of passion will be part of you, which makes it easy for the manager at work or the teacher at school to trigger, by pushing the right button, harmonious or obsessive passion within you. And um, you have to be aware not to let yourself go into that trap that people may be using some of those, you know, uh, mechanism to lead you toward, you know, obsessive passion sometimes. Now, some of the quick findings that we get, you know, th this is an old slide, so I would assume they're probably closer to about a thousand studies because the 2003 JPSP paper was, uh, has been cited over 3,000 times, so at least 500 studies conducted in different labs. When we looked at the prevalence of passion, most people have at least one passion in their life. So, and it's true across, across different countries and so on. Uh, 
putting work aside, people engage at least, you know, on average eight hours a week for uh, an activity they're passionate about. So they re-engage repeatedly in this activity. Um, because passion takes place in people's lives, we've been able and fortunate to study, um, you know, professional painters, not the, the painter that will, you know, take care of your, your fence or your house or something, but, you know, artistic painters, teachers, nurses, atl athletes, musicians, and so on in different cultures. And we, we've studied people across the lifespan up to the 100 years of age. And that gentleman was playing, playing cards a couple of times a week. And that was very important to, to him. I do remember that participant. Passion scale, we have two subscales, assessing harmonious and obsessive passion. Uh, with my good friend Herb Marsh, we've validated the thing and tried different things on invariance and so on. And Herb would say, that scale just won't die. I mean, it's invariant as a function of gender, age, types of activities and languages and so on. Um, and we've used various design, correlations, longitudinal diary studies, experimental, knowing that someone, for instance, is passionate for basketball. We can bring this person in the lab and for about an hour or two, make by pushing the right buttons with the right independent variable, leading the person to, to become, in the session, harmonious or obsessive. So bringing in people who are passionate about something, we can trigger the harmonious or obsessive side, leading to the same findings we find with the passion scale. We've looked at different outcomes, objective assessment, peer reports, and so on. And typically, harmonious passion leads to better well-being and so on. We call it office, optimal functioning in society. So higher levels of psychological, physical, relational well-being. Uh, performance, obsessive passion will give you some performance. Uh, and contributing to society as well. The two types of passion will do that. Different determinants, but I won't get into that today. Those of you might be interested, this is shameful promotion, right, Rich? I mean, we're trying to... <laughs> 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 and uh, we may have a look at this uh, at the book if you are interested. Now, let's look at um, passion and, and resilience. I'd like to uh, uh, acknowledge the contributors, Virginie Paquette, Sonia Rarimi, and... Nathalie Ufa, Barb Fredrickson. And uh, we, we've done a ser different series of studies on, on looking at passion and resilience. I'll be talking about two today. Um, now, resilience is uh, the absence of persisting problems and positive adaptation in the face of adversity. So you're facing adversity, either a stressful situation or experiencing failure. And how do you adapt to that situation? Um, there's been a lot of research on resilience. It's, it's a whole planet in itself, if you look at that literature. And basically, either looking at children and they're facing adversity at home, how do they you know, grow up and who do they become? Uh, traumatic conditions like losing a close one, um, fairly facing daily stressful situations like harassment at work, for instance. But what we've been looking at is along the lines of what Barb Fredrickson's been doing, is looking at the, the resilience process. See, Barb has, has done work on emotion, and she, she's a big name in, in the world of emotion. She put forward the importance of positive emotions. She has a theory that she calls, you know, the Broaden and Bill theory, whereas positive emotion will, al will allow you to develop, you know, self, you know, processes, adaptive self processes, and repertoire that will allow you to face tough situations. And eventually, by using these processes, they will develop and become more permanent in your repertoire. So when you have experiencing positive emotion, you can trigger and you will be able to use those adaptive self processes. And so that's why when she, in her work on resilience, she showed that um, those people who do well when facing adversity are people who still manage to experience positive emotions while they're facing adversity. They will experience negative emotions, but they still manage to experience some positive emotions. Now, our research on, on passion has shown that if you want to experience positive emotion, well, harmonious passion will give it to you. So one and one equal, equals two. We put together the passion literature, uh, our model, and the work of Barb Fredrickson, and we look at the role of passion and emotion in the resilience process. First series of studies that we've done is with uh, Virginie Paquette, and this now just got published in Journal of Personality. And we looked at people who are passionate about their studies and how they, they face adversity of end of year exams. So what we did is that we assessed their passion toward their studies. 
And uh, the, the first study one was within the, during just a cross-sectional study, so during the, uh, the, the final exam period. And we assess their emotion with the PANAS, and, and we assess as well their uh, the well-being, and how they did in the academic realm, so specific, if you want, you know, resilience, as well as the rest of their lives, so in terms of global resilience. So harmonious fashion predicted positive emotions during these, uh, this stressful period, but so did obsessive passion, but not as much. So we'll give you some positive emotion, but not as much as a harmonious passion. But obsessive passion predicts negative emotions during this stress stressful period of the final year exam. Harmonious passion will protect you against negative emotion. So harmonious passion gives you positive emotion and predicts you know, negatively negative emotion. And positive emotion leads to satisfaction with your studies, feeling do that you've done well, and feeling that at the same time, you still have a life and it's going well. Perception of having a successful life. So global resilience, if you like, whereas negative emotion will predict negatively these other outcomes. And this is controlling for the number of hours you put in in your studies, right? So the study one, what it showed is that, indeed, harmonious passion predicted positive emotions during that stressful period and protected you against the negative emotion whereas obsessive passion didn't give you, g gave you some positive emotion, but even, you know, give you, allowed you to experience even more negative emotions that were counterproductive with respect to um, the outcomes. Now, uh, going back one here. Okay, now study two, what we ended up doing is uh, having a prospective study, for prospective design, looking at changes that take place just before the, um, the end of year exam and looking right afterwards. So were there any changes in, in the academic realm and in your life as a function of passion and emotion? So harmonious passion predicted positive emotions that were experienced at time two. Same thing with obsessive passion, you get some. But then obsessive passion predicts negative emotions and you're being protected against negative emotion with harmonious passion. And we use regression residuals to look at changes in the outcomes. So positive emotion lead to increases in satisfaction with your studies. So you, you enjoy your, your studies even more, even though you experience some, something stressful like end of year exam. This is quite something here. And you felt that you've done well, so an increase in performance, and you feel that your, your life, actually your life is better than before. So there's an increase in perception of a successful life. So both in education and in the rest of your life, you feel that you're doing better than before. Negative emotions leads negatively to these outcomes. You're still passionate about it. You, you know, you, you love your studies, but because it comes to control you, the processes are not as adaptive with obsessive passion. All right, the second series of studies we've done, I ju I'll just present one study here because of, of time constraint. Uh, we want to, to remedy some of the problems of the, the first line of study, so we actually randomly assigned people to success and failure. So remember when we were in college and, or even high school, we had those sometimes two exams per day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. What happens to you when you bomb the first exam? Can you regroup and still do well during the second one? Maybe, maybe not. So that's what we tried to study. So basically what we did is that we assessed people's passion for their, for their studies, then we did a, an online study, and we had them do two tasks that were made relevant to their studies. They were the Raven matrices, and right after the first one, we gave them feedback. Either they failed miserably or they did well, and then we assessed their emotions right after, and then they did a second task after that which was, again, relevant to their education. So people were randomly assigned. It's not a perception of this is stressful or not. People actually did well or not well. They failed, and uh, they believed it uh, uh, with manipulation checks and everything. So looking at the findings, this is a dummy coding here. So toward failure, so people, the failure condition experience in a decrease of positive emotions and an increase of negative emotions. So failing actually 
led to negative emotions and, and you know, having, you know, experiencing fewer positive emotions. And what about passion? What does it do to this equation? With harmonious passion, even after having failed, you experience positive emotions. And you're being protected again against negative emotions. So there is something about harmonious passion that allows you to being protected against negative emotions. So it offsets the, the uh, independent variable of failure. Now, with obsessive passion, you, you, you do get some positive emotions. But then there's a further increase in negative emotions. So it's a double whammy. You fail, then you, you, you feel terribly. But if you have obsess obsessive passion, you feel, you feel even worse. And after that, this was an online study. So using rich scale at the situational level. So people, positive emotions led to more vitality afterwards. Uh, feeling the, the general level of high level of life satisfaction. Whereas with negative emotions, basically you experience negative physical symptoms. My eyes are burning, my back is hurting and everything. So you suffer physically sci and psychologically. And unfortunately, you don't get all the positive benefits that you get with harmonious passion. Now, this study was replicated in the second one, again, using the uh, same exper experimental paradigm. And we looked, thank you, and we looked at uh, the, the, the role of, uh, of emotions in objective performance on the second task. And we, we found basically the same thing. Positive emotion lead to a better performance and all the, the goodies that we found in study one. All right, looking at some conclusions because of time constraint. Uh, <coughs> as Barb Fredrickson has, has, has suggested and, and what I've showed here today, positive emotions is a key mediator in the resilience process. It doesn't mean that you won't experience negative emotions. It's that on top of those negative emotions you experience, you will get some positive emotions. And the work that we've done with uh, Charles Etienne Lavoie and uh, Jeremy Werner Fillon has some kind of interesting implication. What we found is that what happens between harmonious passion and positive and negative emotions is the following harmonious passion triggers a challenge mindset. So we've done a couple of studies to look at that. So with harmonious passion, you say, yeah, bring it on. I can do the second exam, no problem. Give it to me. I can do this. And because you do this, this appraisal of challenge allows you to experience positive emotion in the process. With obsessive passion, what you experience is a threat mindset. Oh my God, what if I fail? Oh my God, oh, I just failed. Oh my, I'm so bad, I'm not a good student, and so on. The spiral of rumination <coughs> and threat has take it, taken a, to a toll you know, on the situation and you're gonna be suffering. And um, the other thing is that with harmonious passion, it triggers an adaptive resilience process that will allow you to experience some positive emotion. Even when things don't go well, you can still say, you know what, I can do better. I'm optimistic. I can challenge, I, I can do these things. Now, the other thing I'd like to underscore is that in our work, we've shown that resilience is not only um, uh, subject specific, but it carries on in the rest of your life. So that you will experience some positive goodies, you know, for instance, in education or whatever the situation or the context, sports and work and so on. But it carries on in the rest of your life. So with harmonious passion, you will experience that. Unfortunately, with obsessive passion, uh, you won't because you will probably s be suffering a little bit more uh, than people with harmonious passion. However, what I'd like to underscore in terms of limits is that these studies were done at one point in time, except for the longitudinal study we've done, the online studies. There is something about negative emotions that we're pursuing in terms of better, having a better understanding. It's a long time process. In the short term, it might hurt you. Um, I think that addressing negative emotion and understanding the determinants of such emotions may allow you to grow as well. We're not there yet, but that's something we want to pursue. Thank you very much.